and please. Welcome to the first day of summer, I guess. My name is Neil Strobel. I'm the police chief for the city of Maryland. What we've asked today is to have this time to demonstrate the importance of the, of the decisions that you will make. With graduation right around the corner and some of the summer activities and parties sprinkled throughout, the consequences of your decisions are very important. You will probably see that in many circumstances here today. Last night on this very same track was a very significant track meet, a defining moment for many of the students that participated. We would like to think that there are many defining moments that have happened throughout the careers and the lives of all of the students that preceded you through high school, as well as you here today. Now, it's our hope that this demonstration will provide you with some information that, that might make you step back and slow down your decision-making process. Understand that everything you do has a consequence. It's not in, intended to be entertaining, and it's certainly not intended to be humorous. So what I'd ask for this message, in order to be as meaningful as it absolutely can be, is I would ask that you, you treat it with the reverence that we down here are trying to portray. For a moment, I'd like to ask you, even in your close confines here, to close your eyes and to think about a time when you made a decision that you weren't the most proud of. If you could go back and redo that moment, would you do it the same way? Let me take you back one more step. There are certain decisions that you have made that you lucked out on. Things turned out better than what they could have. What we would like to show is some of those circumstances when the decisions that you made don't turn out as well as they absolutely could have. The decisions that you make right now when you get behind the wheel of a vehicle will impact your lives for a long, long time. Thank 
Are you involved in the crash? No. It was like this when we got here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just go stand by my squad car, okay? Thank you. What? What happened? I. I blocked two more. Are you okay? <laughs> Patients. One fatality laying by the car here. Bring a blanket. Driver's unconscious and the passenger's conscious. Sir. 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 Medic one to rescue one. Gonna need the jaws of life. No access to this vehicle. Please, please bring the jaws. Ma'am? Ma'am, can you hear me? How you doing? My leg hurts. Okay, we're gonna have an EMP over to you shortly. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna be helping them. We got some more people coming. Don't move, okay? This this door is jammed. We're gonna need. Yeah, it really hurts. There's a board here for you. Does it hurt when you take a deep breath? Yeah. Okay. Are you having any pain anywhere else? Which leg? Are you having any neck or spine problems? No. Tell me, hurry up, who's a neck? Oh, 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 oh,
first thing that happened at the traffic crash was the emergency attention that was given to the passengers. You saw various stages of injuries and how they were addressed. That's only part of the accident investigation.
Some of the passengers in the vehicle have left the scene by ambulance, some by flight for life. Some at the coroner's direction by the funeral home. The look in the firefighter's eye as he covered me up with a blanket. I know that you've seen this happen too many times, all because of one decision. Unfortunately, it took this for me to realize it was the wrong decision. Who would have thought that this one choice could change so much? All of my hopes and dreams gone, just like that. The plans of my friends tomorrow, college, a family, my entire future is now in the past. And my family, the grief and sorrow I have just put them through, the vacation plans we had for next week, now they're planning my funeral. I will never have the chance to tell my mom and dad goodbye and how much I love them. My little brother, Colby, the way he looked up to me, did everything that I did. I was everything to that little boy, and he was everything to me. Colby was going to be playing his first Little League game this year. I wasn't going to miss that game for the world. Now I don't have a choice. Please don't let this happen to you. What was I thinking? Getting into a car with a driver that had been drinking? Even something as simple as buckling my seatbelt. Everything could be different now. The plans of my friends tomorrow, college, a family, vacation plans, to tell my mom, dad, and brother I love you and to watch Colby's first little league game. But no, one foolish mistake cost me everything. Don't let the same mistake happen to you. Sir, what I'm going to do is uh, some field sobriety test for me, please. So I'd like to go over by this line. The first test I'm going to do is to check your eyes. I need you to stand with your feet together and your arms at your side. I want you to follow the tip of my finger with your eyes and keep your head still. Do you understand? I'm going to ask you to do is called the walk and turn test. While I'm explaining the test to you, I want you to stand with your right foot in front of your left foot touching your heel to your toe. And keep your hands at your side. What I'm going to ask you to do is take nine steps, stepping heel to toe. When you get to the ninth step, I want you to make short, choppy steps and come back to the same direction you came. Uh, I want you to count all loud with each step, and while you're performing the test, keep your hands to your side and watch your feet. Do you understand the instructions? Okay, go ahead and start the test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Based on the sobriety test that I had performed and on the 
consequences for all of them. As we move forward in time, I'd like to have a snapshot of what has happened tonight, this afternoon here, portrayed later on in their life, to see just what the ramifications are of the decision that they made. You heard the comments earlier that all of the plans that they had are now changed. We'll see just how dramatic those changes are as we find out from some of the medical personnel and the arresting officers what have happened since this tragic night. When I started the comments out earlier this afternoon, I asked you to think of a time when you'd like to flip back the clock and to change something that you would, you've made, a decision that you've done. Would this be one of those times? Probably, probably so in the lives of each of the people that were here. Can you share with us what you think has happened as a result of this incident? As a result of this uh, tragedy, these young people are going to have their lives changed very dramatically. I'd like to say a few minutes, uh, say a few words about Emma, uh, the young lady who was in the front seat and my involvement in helping take care of her. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, say a few words about how this has brought back memories about my own life. When I was a senior in high school, one of my best friends and the uh, quarterback on our high school football team was involved in an accident like this, also involved in alcohol. Uh, he was planning on playing college football at UW-Whitewater, and I was very excited about the prospects down there. But uh, as a result, uh, very nasty accident. He broke his neck and he spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Uh, it took him about 10 years to move on in his life and get over what had happened, but he subsequently put things together, but I can't imagine what, what he had to go through all as a result of one really bad decision. Uh, bringing back the scene to where we are in this accident, and I was brought to our emergency department and I was on duty helping coordinate her care with surgeons, nurses, x-ray techs, radiologists, and all the other people involved in working to um, save the life of this young lady. She came in on a long board, which means that she was strapped down tight, as you saw. Uh, she couldn't move anywhere. Uh, her neck was immobilized. First thing we did was put a couple of IVs in to make sure she got fluid so she didn't bleed to death while we were assessing her. Uh, next thing we did was very quickly assess her from head to foot, and we found a few very nasty injuries. Uh, the, most the most obvious but least significant, at least from our perspective, was a very ugly laceration across her face. Uh, this is going to be something that she's going to have to, we will deal with, and she will deal with down the road, but uh, it's relatively insignificant at the moment. She had a very bad injury to her chest, and she had no breast sounds in her left lung, which meant that her lung was collapsed. So one of the first things we did was put a tube about the size of your little finger into the left side of her chest to suck all the air and blood out that accumulated so that the lung could re-expand. Um, that allowed her to breathe more effectively and um, gave us some time to assess the rest of her injuries. Once we started getting some IV fluids in and started stabilizing her, it became very apparent that she had internal injuries. Her abdomen was rigid, board-like, and uh, it was obvious that she was filling up with blood. 
We brought in a surgeon on call who helped assess her while we were getting x-rays and doing laboratory tests. Uh, we did x-rays of her chest, her pelvis. Uh, there was an obvious injury to her uh, right leg, which uh, we, again, uh, would deal with later, but uh, x-rayed us uh, initially just to see where we were. We also ran her through the CT scanner, which determined what the, the extent of her injuries were and helped our surgeon plan where he was going to go with his surgical approach. Uh, what we determined was that she had a, a ruptured spleen, which meant that she would have to have a major operation with about a, a five or six inch um, incision in her abdomen to remove her spleen. Spleen is not an organ that you need to survive, but it has uh, very important functions in terms of the way you handle blood and fight infections. Uh, this is something she can live without and that had to be removed. The other injuries that she had were a fractured pelvis, which meant that she was going to be bedridden for about four to six months and would not be able to walk without assistance. Another injury that I alluded to earlier was the fractured femur, which would mean that she would have to have orthopedic surgery, probably two or three operations over the course of the next several months. That would involve putting a uh, metal plate onto the broken bone to stabilize it so the leg could be moved so it didn't uh, completely atrophy and um, have blood clots while it was healing. Along about the time we were doing all these things and assessing her, uh, it took a few minutes to repair the laceration on her face. It was, again, about a four-inch uh, nasty, ugly laceration across her forehead. Um, I had, had the opportunity to work on that while we were waiting for x-rays and other tests and uh, we repaired it to the best that we could at the time, but uh, down the road she was going to be very unhappy with the look of it. And as it happens in most of these cases, they go to a plastic surgeon who tries to do what he can to deal with these kinds of cases after the fact. Uh, he probably, she would probably have two or three more operations on the facial laceration just to get the scar to the point where it wasn't as noticeable, but it's not something that can ever go away just like the rest of her other injuries. So Emma's going to have to so many things to remind her of this day for the rest of her life, and every day when she looks at that scar, she's and re be reminded about why we always suggest that people wear seatbelts. You and I'm crafty and weird as a few of them are we don't really know what to expect. Hopefully, at least the family has been notified, but we still have to notify them to start the next process. A lot of times, the main question that they have is, can we see them again? When we get to a scene, there's a lot of dried blood, torn clothing, and we never know what to expect until we actually get back and do some of the work, washing, cleaning up, and our actual prep work so that we can possibly have a funeral or a viewing so that the friends and relatives can actually see this person one more time. The emotions are high, both on the family side and on our side, because an accident is always hard to take, no matter if it's a rela relation to you, or if it's even just someone you didn't care about. It's the age, the, the tragedy of what had happened that causes the most problems for everyone. And we try to do as much as we can to at least console the family, or at least have them there to see that individual one more time. Thanks. The toughest question that we face in law enforcement setting, thing that we have ever had to deal with in law enforcement, as we continue to stand in front of you to drive home the point of the importance of your decision making, the doctor alluded to the injuries to a passenger in a vehicle. So there are consequences even when you don't have necessarily the control over all of the components of that decision. I alluded last night to the fact that we had a track meet here, and one of those events is the passing of the torch, or the baton, I should say. As we do this presentation throughout this evening, we're going to give you several different 
portrayal, so if the incidents that happened, we're going to pass our microphone, and at the end of that microphone chain, we hope that we're handing it off to you to take it back to your homes and your families and your decisions throughout the summer. How are you guys doing today? Not too bad. My name is Shannon Tasker. I'm a flight paramedic at the Spiro Marshfield. I wish I could tell you that this was a very uncommon occurrence, but every weekend from probably the beginning of April until the end of the school year, I guarantee you our helicopter flies two to five times a night on accidents very similar to these. Um, the doctor gave brief descriptions, or actually very thorough descriptions on the injuries that were sustained on the patient that he took care of. We had very similar injuries with the patient that were transporting the Marshfield. We transport on the Marshfield uh, through a level two trauma center, and what they do there is take care of uh, basic injuries all the way up to the most significant to uh, dealing with organ donation when uh, your injuries are not sustainable to uh, life. You guys can donate your organs, you know, down there. We also have a good rehab facility. He told you that she would take four to six months to rehabilitate. Our young man was complaining of uh, no feeling below his waist. His recovery time could be anywhere from six to eight months to years and never fully recover. What you guys don't understand is a lot of times your problems are really close to home. So these accidents happen. You don't think twice about it, but your parents might hear a phone call, a scanner, and they come to the scene, and I can't tell you how many times I've worked on a scene similar to this where your parents have stood 15 feet away from you you while you die. Okay, that's that's the reality of it. You're you're taking chances that's of your own accord. You gotta understand the consequences of your actions. What kind of pain that's gonna cause your family. You ever thought about that? Can you imagine what it would be a parent to watch their child die? You can't do the reality of it. We can paint you up, we can bring all this equipment in there but it's not real. You don't hear the screaming, the noise, the chaos, the unbelievable tragedy that's there. You can't smell it. You can't smell the blood on the road or the alcohol right now. And that's just the plain reality of it. You guys need to be responsible for your actions. You need to think about your families. So when you guys are out there this weekend, be responsible. You can enjoy yourselves, but think about what you're doing. All right, thank you. Those of us in law enforcement can probably tell you how many sirens we've heard in the air since this event has been deadlined. There's, one, there's another one, and I think that's number five, if my count is right. This is not the sound that I as a parent want to hear. But every time my kids aren't home, I think I hear the sound of something that's not going to be very pleasant. So from a parent's standpoint, not, a, not the chief, I want you to take something out of here. And that is that every one of your parents are more concerned than they're letting you believe. Please do what you can not to give them the opportunity to have to experience an encounter with our officers in situations similar to this. Can you tell us what happened to the driver? My name is Brian Kingsley. I'm the Deputy Sheriff with the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department. The mock crash, which you just witnessed here today, could be very real. The smashed cars, the broken glass, the innocent bodies in a vehicle, the lifeless body of your best friend. Nobody wants this, but again, this could happen to you if you decide to drink and drive or get a ride from somebody that has been drinking. You might ask yourself, what's going to happen to James, the drunk driver? James might have been thought of as an honor student or maybe just one of the guys, but I can tell you that James has been arrested. There's no honor in getting arrested. James is going straight to jail. While at the jail, James is going to get transported to Good Samaritan Health Center here in Merrill. He's going to get some blood drawn. Blood is drawn to determine the blood alcohol concentration 
for how intoxicated he is. After that blood is drawn, it gets sent to the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene down in Madison for a result. Those results get sent back to us. The trip to the hospital is complete and James is going back to jail. While at the jail, he gets his fingerprints and mugshot taken. After answering numerous questions, the booking process is now complete. James is changing over from his designer clothing into a jail uniform. James is going to get escorted into a holding cell. The holding cells at the Lincoln County Jail measure seven feet wide by seven feet long by 10 feet high, and they're made out of concrete blocks. It has a concrete bed in it. James is going to have a two inch thick plastic mattress to lay on for the night. He's also going to get a plastic pillow. But you can forget about a television or a telephone. He doesn't get any of those luxuries. James is going to stay in that holding cell until he's escorted over to the courthouse the next afternoon for his initial appearance. James can't walk with the greatest of ease. His ankles are restrained. His wrists are restrained and are attached by a belt. James gets escorted into the courtroom. The judge is watching his every move. There's a lawyer there to meet James. He's going to have a lawyer sitting next to him. But the lawyer might not have much to say. People are in the courtroom to see James, but not the people he would want there. The news reporters, the television cameras, the newspaper employees, they all want to take James's picture and broadcast his story. James always wanted to be in the news, but not this way. After court, uh, his initial appearance, uh, the judge sets a bond. The bond that the judge sets is so high that his parents can't even post a bail. He's going to have to sit in jail till his next court appearance. Three days from now, his best friend Mike that died in that crash, his funeral takes place. James cannot attend the funeral since he's still incarcerated in jail. He could not even tell his best friend goodbye. For the next 40 years, the bars that surround James are going to remind him of the fatal mistake that he made that night. Please don't make that fatal mistake. Don't choose to drink and drive or get in a vehicle that somebody has been drinking. Thank you. I'm with the Neural Fire Department. I've worked 25 years on the fire department. I've seen many accidents like this and other accidents where people have been killed or injured. And about a year ago, I was on an accident that was totally different, at least for me, than uh, all the other ones I've been on. I was walking up to the accident, and uh, one of my fellow workers told me my son was in the, in the car. Uh, we had, he was trapped in the car. I had to use the jaws of life just like we used on this car over there. We had to pry it open. Uh, I rode to the hospital with him. He had uh, two broken legs, a broken arm, uh, a lot of lacerations. Um, took him to the hospital. He had to have uh, three surgeries. Uh, pretty rough year he spent in. He spent a wheel in the wheelchair for a month. Uh, it was tough. One time I can remember I spent a lot of time with him when he first uh, got hurt. And uh, he was in a wheelchair. And he was, or I should say, he had to sit on a bed down and he was throwing up. At the, same time, he looks over at me and he says, Dad, this really sucks. And that's, uh, if you ever have to go through something like this, that's about what you can always say. It really does suck to go through a car, bad car accident. Um, you know, you got to use your head you know, when you're driving. Not just when you're drinking and driving, but just think of uh, reckless driving. Uh, the other day we were practicing for this, and we saw the cars racing around the parking lot doing donuts and spinning out. And 
I was, and we were all commenting, we couldn't believe how kids were doing that, and we thought, oh, we were kids, maybe we did the same thing, but you realize somebody could step out from behind a car when you're doing that, and you could hit them, you could kill them right out in the parking lot. You don't have to be going 60 miles an hour down your road, you don't have to be drinking, and you don't have to be taking drugs or anything. You could be just screwing around, driving fast, or driving stupid, and you kill somebody from it. So, you know, a car is not a toy. I know I tell my sons, and they say I preach all the time, and I know you guys have preached that too, but you just got to realize there's consequences to your actions. Uh, another thing I want to talk a little bit about seatbelts. Um, always wear your seatbelt. My kids say, well, you don't need them in town or whatever. We don't wear them all the time. Well, if you don't wear your seatbelts, you're, you're going to get injured more or possibly get killed. We see it all the time. People say, well, I got airbags. I don't need seatbelts. Airbags don't work without seatbelts. When I was a kid, nobody wore seatbelts because if you climbed in a car with somebody that put a seatbelt on, you jumped out because you thought they were a bad driver. But times have changed and you know, it's the law, so just put your seatbelt on, you know, everybody might think, well, they're kind of nerdy for putting it on because none of the rest of us have them, we're just riding around, why do you need it? But just think, you could save your life or save somebody else's life. So, just a few things to, to uh, take into consideration. One thing, uh, my son is, is doing good now, and I, I got to thank God for that because I know at least three other firefighters that have actually had their uh, sons or daughters killed in car accidents and had to respond to that scene. And I don't want to do that, and I don't want to respond to any scenes where you're, you're killed or injured. So just use your head and learn uh, driving is an old big responsibility. Thank you a lot. Next up, I want to uh, invite Chris Murray up, up here. He was the one that set all this up and really did a lot of work on it. So I'd like to give, you a, give him a big hand when he came up here. He spent a lot of time there. We're going to have a brief delay right now. The helicopter's got to leave to respond to Blue Iron Mountain for another call. So they're going to be firing up here within a few seconds, and we have to wait for them to leave.
Can I have your attention, please? I just want to say thanks to everybody that helped put this thing together. Um, I'm going to start with uh, everybody at school here, Mr. McCartney and the rest of the staff. I don't know how this ever would have got done without Ms. Sikowski and the entire MP3 crew. Uh, all the camera people you see out here. This isn't the only time that these people have been together. We've had five or six other practices, um, including all last Sunday afternoon when it was about 20 degrees out here. Um, the students that were involved in this that donated their time were Dan Moore, Derek Meyer, Kyle Robler, Molly Greenwood, and Shay Stevenson. I'd also say, like to say a big thanks to Fire Chief Hansen and the rest of the Merrill Fire Department for putting up with all my demands the last month and a half. Um, a big thank you to Chief Strobel and the rest of the Merrill Police Department, the members of the Link County Sheriff's Department that helped me out, um, mostly Officer Kingsley and Gus Kaler, who is our dispatcher up behind you up in the booth. The Spirit of Marshfield and the flight crew who had to leave before I got to say thanks to them. From Dr. Zimbrick from the Good Samaritan Health Center, Wade's Funeral Home, and Rod Zrecker who donated a couple of cars that we use today. I'd also like to give a big thanks to the Merrill Optimist Pepsi Bottling Company, Dave's County Market, and Guy's Meat Service, who donated some refreshments for afterwards. There's a bunch of Pepsi products over there. Uh, I'd like to also say one last thanks to every one of you who are watching this program and who will watch this program on the on MP3. It'll be aired later. I'd like to say thank you to ahead of time for taking just two seconds and thinking about this every time you get into a vehicle. If you guys like to come down and grab something to drink, come out, look at our vehicles, uh, look at the cars, ask any questions to anybody that's involved down here. Uh, we can work